Hi, my name is Andrew Greenfield, and today with my fellow Red Book authors, as you can see pictured on screen, we're going to take you through a deep dive of Azure Spectrum Virtualized for Public Cloud. We have a companion video, of course, for Amazon Web Services, and all of this is completely printed in the IBM Spectrum Virtualized for Public Cloud Red Book. You'll be able to find these links in the metadata and also at the end of this particular video. IBM is in the process of rebranding. So everywhere you see Spectrum, we're actually going to be changing that into storage. So it's really called Storage Virtualize or Storage Virtualize for Public Cloud. SV4PC becomes SVPC. There's a lot of updates for 2023. So I'm going to go through that in this slide, focusing on the Azure updates. The Amazon updates for AWS are on a separate video. All of them are in the book that we mentioned for redbooks.com. The great thing about Storage Virtualized for Public Cloud is that it can easily complement an on-premise flash system ring, so you can start replicating in less than 20 minutes. Or if you want to do all in cloud, great. You have a wonderful way of doing all block storage inside the cloud using dedupe and compression, all in software, saving you costs. And that way you can use not only AWS, but also Azure clouds and replicate between all of those as well as different regional centers. Either way you deploy, it's three virtual machines, all RHEL 8s, and you can change the pricing as well as the performance simply by changing the default deployments as you deploy. And that means you can also have other deployments for other performance needs. And this also includes the backend disks, which we'll explore in a little bit. The deployment couldn't be easier. Simply go to the IBM website, and that's the Passport Advantage. If you don't have a customer number, time for you to grab one. Once you do, simply purchase however much capacity, usable that is, that you'd like, and then use that customer number when you go into the Azure or AWS Marketplace. Remember, this video is focusing on the Azure Marketplace. So if you want the AWS, please use the metadata or feel free to look at the book and you'll see that it's very similar deployment. And we'll be showing this live later on in this demo. Let's take a look at that overview. The top is the Quorum virtual machine, and that's going to be useful for our management functionality. The bottom two, however, are load balancers that are going to be actually doing all the iSCSI work, and they're going to be talking to the backend Azure managed disks. Now, all of this is easily done inside one resource group when you deploy, but if you want, you can have multiple SV for PCs in the same resource group, as well as replicating it to other clouds or back to the on-premise. It's the exact same interface, and we'll take a look at that in the upcoming slides. Let's focus on that hybrid cloud architecture just for a second. On the left-hand side, we can see an on-premise flash system deployment. NVMe hosts, fantastic. And by the way, for backend storage, if you don't want to use ours, you can also use over 500 other external vendors all through Fiber Channel or iSCSI storage links. Either way, it's the same exact GUI and replication to SV for PC in Azure or AWS. And as you can see on the Azure side, we have those managed disks down below. We have all the workload going to node one and node two. And just for management, we actually have the quorum all talking to any physical or virtual hosts you have in that particular cloud, or in this case, resource group. Don't forget, you can have multiple SV for PCs in the same or multiple resource groups. Now let's talk about the virtual machines that you'll be deploying. There's a couple different options. The most focus should be on the nodes themselves, not the quorum. The quorum's not doing any workload at all. Only the nodes are. You can go from low, medium to high. This is the biggest choice that you have, other than obviously how much capacity that you're going to give to them. And after deployment, you need to redeploy to a new instance if you decide to change out, if you want to have more bandwidth or lowest latency later on. However, if you just change out the disks, you do not have to redeploy. We'll go over that in a future slide. Now let's take a look at a new feature, volume groups. Unlike consistency groups, volume groups opens up a whole new doorway. Not only can you put various volumes into one particular volume group and then make that immutable, that's right, safeguarded copies, which we'll discuss next, but then you can also use a replication policy for it or easily schedule a snapshot policy for it using the internal scheduler or an external scheduler. It has a lot of other great framework additions, so don't feel that you need to use consistency groups anymore for those old timers out there. Volume groups are the new way going forward to really manage all of your multiple volumes into manageable groups. Safeguarded copies have been around for the last year and a half and even longer for the DS8, but what they mean on the cloud side and why they're featured here as a new feature is we've upgraded them to use them inside volume groups. And if you're new to them, 
How about this? Unlike regular snapshots, which are just delta copies of the original volume, safeguarded copies are immutable. That's right, you can't erase them. They can only be timed out or a very specialized user can uh, remove them. The key thing is, is that you can take safeguarded copies now either on-prem or in one of your cloud instances and then send it somewhere else and it's immutable. Not only that, you can use the internal scheduler to schedule those immutable copies at any particular time or those safeguarded copies. And this is a key thing because you can replicate very quickly and easily faster than moving the data from somewhere else. Now let's talk about multi-factor authentication. We've just added Duo security, as you can see on the left-hand side, as well as IBM security. So now you can add that to your SE for PC as well as on-premise flash system. We've already had single sign-on with IBM security and Microsoft Azure Active Directory, but you can also use LDAP as well. As we talked about earlier, with new policy-based frameworks, I also have policy-based replication. So that means that once I put volumes in a volume group, I can then assign a replication policy to that. So it'll handle its policy and how often it will send from either an on-premise or from a cloud-based to another on-premise or cloud-based system of SV for PC. So this is a key thing that'll simplify your life so that you can set up your recovery point or recovery time objective based on your business values. Another enhancement that we have is the enhanced replication over IPsec. Basically, this means that any data in flight is 100% secured using IPsec, using a variety of different certificates that you can plug in. This is the key because you don't have to use any external encryption methods to make sure your replication traffic is secure. In case you're using any of our replication, here's a list of the ports you need to make sure are open between your VPC or your resource group to the other SV for PC, especially if you're using policy-based replication. And in case you're using transparent cloud tiering, now we have this because a lot of people like to use various different third tiers like Amazon's S3 or object-based storage for their snapshots, or in this case, their cloud tiering of snapshots or recovery points. So you can do that as well using SV for PC. So instead of just replicating to another on-premise or cloud-based flash system using snapshots, you can also use those various object-based buckets. Now let's make sure you have an IBM customer number and you've purchased the right amount of capacity and we'll go through the rest of the demo and install, let alone the flash system setup or the SV for PC setup. You click on marketplace, then we're gonna actually search for the IBM Spectrum Virtualize and now we'll click on create. I'm gonna put this into a brand new resource group and because I'm on the western side of the United States, I'll use that as my zone. I'm going to give a huge shout out to Max and Peter as I name things because they've been great on the IBM Technology Zone, helping out lots of folks. I am going to make sure to roll back on failure just to clean up things. You can see this is where we're going to choose our VMs. This is very critical for you in terms of performance. Make sure you use a very strong password here and then confirm it. This is where you're gonna put in your IBM customer number. And if you don't have the right one, this is where the deployment will fail. Make sure you put in a very accurate email because this is where it's going to ship a lot of the credential information and IP information during the deployment. If you don't have a key pair, feel free to use Azure. That's what I'm gonna do right now. This will be very crucial for you using the various CLI methods to connect. I'm gonna use the default networking this is where you actually choose your disk type as well as how much. Azure is going to go ahead and review everything. I'm gonna review it right now as myself, looks good. I'll click on create. It lets me then immediately download the key. You can take a look at that key right over here on the lower right. Now the deployment itself, I'm gonna speed up because it'll take a long time, but you'll actually see it go through various different phases, but you'll see all the screens I just want to make sure that everyone sees why it's going a little bit faster. I click on refresh a lot of times to make it seem like it's actually going faster than it really is. You're looking at about 15 minutes for a deployment. Once it's succeeded, we can actually pin that to our dashboard or go right into it, which we will in just a second here. I want to show one last screen where it actually shows all succeeded. Once it's succeeded, I can go to the resource group where you can actually see the key pair as well as 
those M disks, the default VNet, as well as my virtual machines. Now let's go into creating the virtual machine so we can access the GUI of SV for PC. Go in and create a resource, create a virtual machine. To keep down on costs, I'm going to use one of the lower versions of Windows, but I'm going to put that in the existing resource group that I used earlier. And if you want, you can actually use some of the extra options. I won't be using them. I'll just be creating a base virtual machine here. I'll be switching from the Ubuntu to Windows. And again, since this is just for management, I'm not going to care about performance. I'll make sure to put in a good username that I'll be using in other areas of my SC for PC. So I'll be using super user. Make sure to use a very good password as well. Now, this is a very key step here. Make sure you open up some of the ports so that you can get into this machine either using the Bastion service or from a public IP if you decide to expose it to the public IPs. Either way, you need to make sure a little bit more ports are open. So in this case, both of HTTPs. The rest of the options are very much default where you don't have to change anything, especially since it's management and there's not much that needs to be changed. Same thing on networking. It'll choose the defaults from earlier in the same resource group. This is where you actually change if you want a public or a private IP. These are some extra management options. You'll see that I'm just going to scroll through, but I don't select any of those. It's up to your business practices and compliance in case you need it. And there's nothing really that we need to do on the advanced tab either. Just in case you want to add additional tags. And as before, now that we'll validate and review and then click on create. You'll see that it's deploying. And again, I'm going to speed this up as well. You can see that under deployments, a nice little shortcut, by the way, as you can see on screen here, once it's deployed, then we can actually use that for our next step. There's its public IP address. And now let's connect to it. As you can see, if you don't already have a Bastion service, you need to create one. So I'm going to deploy that Bastion service right now. You'll see it adds a Bastion subnet in the upper right hand corner. We can confirm that it's actually created here. Notice succeeded. Now let's try to connect again using that same Bastion service. Make sure to remove the default value here and put in the correct username. Obviously make sure to put in the correct password. Once we connect, you're going to see that it opens up a special set of windows here using the Bastion service we just deployed and this will go into the actual Windows VM. Once we're inside the Windows VM, make sure that it can actually talk to the various networks. Now in the browser, you're going to allow it to talk out to the outside web or at least to its VPC. 
and we're going to put in the IP address that we got over email from our earlier step. You can see at the top part of that email, cluster IP, which I'll highlight, and I'll copy and paste and put it into the browser window. Now, step three, let's set up that SV for PC array. This is the same setup on any on-premise flash system as well as any other SV per C. We'll put in that IP address. We'll actually click on advanced because it's using its self-signed certificate. We'll connect into it. Feel free, of course, to change the certificate to anything that your business needs. This will be where you'll put in the password that we defined earlier. Once we sign in, we have to go through a system setup. Basically, you'll be clicking on next and agreeing to the license agreement, as well as changing the password. That's right, as part of SC4C, we're gonna change the default password that you just entered from the deployment to another secure password. Now we'll name that actual system. Depending on your business needs, if you've added any other additional licenses. You don't need to enter a DNS. However, you should change the time zone to whatever your business requires. And if you want, this is where you actually can set up call home. In this case, I don't really need to set up call home, but you'll see it nags me anyway. Feel free to do so. But remember, since this is running software, there's no hardware to go bad, but feel free to set up call home afterwards. Once we click on close, it's going to log in using that brand new credential into the actual GUI. If you're familiar with on-premise flash system, this should look exactly the same because it is the exact same GUI. Take a look, this is the actual on-premise view, but if you notice, it looks only like software because that's what it is. That's why you don't see any pretty pictures of any hardware because it's all in software. However, you can still bring up performance and everything else like you would on an on-premise flash system. Exactly the same, exact same commands. Next thing we need to do though is to take those MDISs that we defined earlier and we need to add them to a pool. There they are down below. I just need to assign them. So I can right click and then I can actually import them into a tier or I can actually use a bunch of different commands if you want by going into pools and creating create pool. I can choose to make it a data reduction pool. So I'll do data dedupe as well as compression. And this is where I also would name it in case you don't want pool zero. As you can see, it says no storage, but we'll take care of that right now by moving those MDISs that we saw on the last screen into it. So there's lots of different ways you can do this, but this is just a different way from some of the other videos. I wanted to make sure you see it. This is where we actually tell it what kind of disks we're putting in there. As you see, we click on add storage. It's gonna grab those MDISs, which are Azure managed disks underneath all of this and it's gonna put them into that particular pool. Once it's in that pool, you can click on close. There it is, the pool. You can see that it's got a terabyte ready to be used for volumes that you're gonna to provision to hosts. Here it is in a nice view screen. And now, simply create some volumes. Now, I don't have any volumes to find. I don't have any host to find, but I'll actually show you how to do volumes just because it's quick and easy. So for example, here's one volume, I'll name it, I'll give it one gig, and then I'll save it so it actually sends it out. And of course I can do additional capacity savings. Since I didn't put it in a DRP, it's only gonna be thin provisioned. But if it was DRP, you could dedupe it as well. Once it creates that volume, you're ready to provide that volume to any host that you defined in the system. Now right now there's no host, and that's pretty much the end of the demo because you can create your own hosts. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Andrew Greenfield or any of my Redbook authors. If you wanna see how to add hosts, as you can see, it's real easy to do here. 
where you would basically add the iSCSI IQ end and then click on save. There's an alternative that I want you to be aware of using the CLI or Ansible. So we just showed the GUI method of setting it up. Let's actually take a look at what you will use if you want to do this all with the CLI and not use a GUI management. As you can see under Spectrum Virtualize in the Ansible collections or a Galaxy Playbook, I've got a set up the system, YAML. You can actually do it step by step using the CLI or command line interface user guide. Thanks again for watching this video. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out, email, or post comments. Me and my fellow Red Book authors would be glad to get back with you. And most importantly, I can't wait to see you at an upcoming IBM event. I look forward to seeing you soon.